Now let's get back to Benjamin Davidson and water purposes. This note refers to the land north of Proctor House Museum, which is mostly Proctor Park today. Benjamin Davidson had settled north of Spring Valley and would engage in many land transactions with Isaac C. Proctor over the years. Many mortgages were put in place to support these land transactions, mostly financed by the Proctors. It is possible that Benjamin Davidson and his son Simon operated mills in this area during this period. Then, John Edward Proctor took advantage of his financial leverage with the mortgages and gradually took over possession of this property. Through the 1850s, the land north of Proctor House would become part of Proctor Farm. There were significant woodlands in the property, which would provide product for the lumber industry, some of it contracted to Gilmore's in Trenton. But we should not forget the importance of Butler Creek as the source of energy to run gristmills and sawmills at a time when that was critical to the growth of the community. On a related note, this image was sent to me by Catherine Stutt of the Brighton Digital Archives, who is doing the scanning of the documents from Memory Junction Museum. This is one that she was curious about. The label says that this picture shows Proctor Bridge downstream from Downsey Mill. This snip of the 1878 Belden County Atlas shows Brighton Village in the dark color and on up to the right to the north is Spring Valley. On the far right is Davidson Pond north of Spring Valley and downstream from there there is a black square which represents a large building which is a sawmill. This shows that there was a sawmill in this location earlier than 1878, and it would later be called Downsey Mill. Proctor Bridge was downstream a little from the mill, where the creek opens up into the second pond. And by the way, Downsey is spelled E-Y. Here's another image that was sent to me from the Bangate Collection. It shows the Downsey Mill in 1920, with some of the workmen standing out front. Frank Downsey, the owner, is second from the left, is seated. Jacob Bose is just to his immediate right. Charlie Gainforth, Downsey's brother-in-law, is second to his left. What a great picture. Do you recall the problems we had with high water during 2017? Here's something that may be called a positive result of all that high water. This timber floated to the surface of Presque Isle Bay during 2017 and was found by members of the Yacht Club, which is out at the east end of Price Street in Gosport. They contacted the Brighton Digital Archives and the timber was taken to Hilton Hall for a time, as you can see in this picture. When things were arranged, the timber was taken to Proctor House Museum and installed on the lawn there just to the left of the walkway. This timber that we're looking at here was part of the underlying structure of the wharf that was built at the east end of Price Street in Gosport. The wharf was built in 1841 by John Nix Sr. and his son John Nix Jr. Soon after it was built it was taken over by John Jr. and he operated it until around 1851 when it was taken over by John Edward Proctor. A plaque on the timber says, Legend has it that John Edward Proctor included the Belvedere on the house above you for the purpose of observing shipping activity at his wharf. We have seen that John Edward Proctor was in partnership with Abija Squire for the store at the corner of Main and Young Street. Records show that this pair was also heavily engaged in the trade and shipping of lumber. However, on page 186 of the Toby book, we see a slight twist to this story. This is a list of schooners and cargo on seven different days in 1848. It is important to note that this lumber is being imported and not exported. We hear a lot about the massive export of lumber during this period, but here we see examples of lumber being brought in to Nix's Wharf. 
This demonstrates that we should think of trade in lumber at this period as being in both directions and not exclusively for export. On the topic of Gosport, pages 186 and 187 of the Toby book contain an explanation of the developments in 1848 that led to the creation of the village Gosport. A full survey of the village was done at this time to confirm the street names that we know of Bay Street along the South Shore, and then Price Street, which went all the way to Nix's Wharf to the east, and then Queen and Elgin Streets, and of course, the north-south streets of Baldwin and Lambton. This map shows all four wharfs in the area as of the 1860s. Of course, in 1848, only Nix's Wharf existed there to the east end of Price Street. Quick's Wharf at Center Street off to the west and the two wharfs on Bay Street in Gosport were built in the 1850s in response to the peak traffic of that time. The name Gosport was applied to the village in 1848 as well. The post office had recently come under the responsibility of the province, and there was a major push going on to reduce duplicate names. As a result, the name of Newcastle was changed to Gosport. The next time you come down to Presque Isle Bay, try to imagine all these schooners out in the bay and tied up at the wharf, and all these men in teamster wagons on the road getting ready to unload. This was a busy time, which meant growth and prosperity for the community. The name Thomas D. Sanford has been mentioned in a previous item. In fact, the name Thomas Dorman Sanford carried down through Brighton history with four gentlemen carrying the same name. The first, Thomas Dorman Sanford, came from Connecticut and settled in Upper Canada around the same time and around the same place as the Proctor family. These two families would compete and collaborate in real estate and business as the years went by and Brighton grew. On page 643 of the Toby book, we see this portrait of Thomas Dorman Sanford, he being the third on our list. He was a farmer near Brighton and engaged in local municipal government until he passed away in 1913. His widow, who was Sarah Weller, then took her son, the fourth Thomas Dorman Sanford, and they moved to Michigan. The best known individual of the Sanford family was probably William Holly Sanford, who was a son of the first Thomas Dorman Sanford. He operated the Sanford Hotel for several decades in the middle of the 1800s. It was also called the Brighton Hotel. But by whatever name, the Brighton newspapers in 1853 provided support in saying, probably no other hotel enters more into the life picture of Brighton than the Sanford Hotel situated immediately west of Proctor and Squire's store in Young Street, and about 75 feet north of Main Street. We can see by this sketch of the main intersection of Brighton from page 130 of the Toby book that the Sanford Hotel was located about where Sobeys is today. It backed onto Sanford Street, leaving a large area to Main Street for parking and the turning of stagecoaches. In my book, 38 Hours to Montreal, I conjured the idea that Mr. Weller might not want to stop at Sanford Hotel in the middle of Brighton in midday. So he decided to stop at Proctor Inn at Huff Road to the west of Brighton instead, thus avoiding busy downtown Brighton in 1840. Another newspaper item related to Mr. Sanford's hotel in 1851 can be found on page 211 of the Toby book. There are good fires in every room, and the worthy host is himself all attention. The Brighton Hotel compares favorably with any hotel. And Mr. Sanford has erected a splendid signboard so that passengers may not be at a loss as to where to call. It's clear to me from many archive documents that advertising was critical 
for the stagecoach and hotel business in those days. Another example of this in this newspaper ad from 1833, found on page 253 of the Toby book, says, The Royal Mail stage leaves Brighton for east and west daily. The Sanford Hotel was an important stage stop on the main road and in a bustling town. Another well-known member of the Sanford family in Brighton was Dr. Charles Marcus Sanford, who was the son of the second Thomas Dorman Sanford from our earlier list of four. On page 480 of the Toby book, we see Dr. Charles M. Sanford commenced practice at his office on lot 40 and would be coroner from 1884 to 1899. Dr. Sanford practiced medicine in Brighton from around 1884 to his death in 1936. He practiced out of his home, which was common in those days. His house was on Sanford Street at the corner of Platt Street. The names Sanford and Proctor were obvious and prominent through a century of Brighton history, as is evident by streets named in their honor. 